In this lesson, we will define P groups and prove a couple of results about P groups. First, let's give some basic definitions. Throughout, we're going to let G be a group. And P, it will always represent a prime number. And first definition, a group of order P to the N for some non-negative integer N This group is called a P group. Second, subgroups of group G, which are P groups, are called P subgroups. Thirdly, if G is a group, of order p to the n times m, where p does not divide m, so essentially g is a group and p to the n is the largest power of p that divides the group order. Then a subgroup of order p to the n is called a silo p subgroup. of G. So we have a P group is any group of order prime power P to the N. If a subgroup is a P group, we call that a P subgroup. And then in the particular case when P to the N is the largest power of P that divides the group order, then any subgroup of order P to the N is called a silo P subgroup. Now recall that we've already proved Silo's first theorem, and now in terms of P subgroups, we can say that given any group G and a prime power dividing the order of G, we know that P subgroups exist. And in particular, we know that Silo P subgroups exist as well for any prime P dividing the group order G. So Silo's first theorem guarantees that P subgroups and Silo P subgroups in particular exist. One more definition. In the future we'll prove some theorems about Silo P subgroups. So it can be helpful to have a notation for the number of Silo P subgroups of a group G. So the number of Silo P subgroups of G will be denoted
by n sub p. So for any particular group G, the number of CLP subgroups is n sub p. One quick example to illustrate the definition of, of p subgroups. Consider the a group of order 360. We saw in an earlier example that this, this order has is uh, 8 times 9 times 5, so 2 cubed times 3 squared times 5 equals 360. So if G has order 360, then for example, any subgroup of order 8 would be called a CELO 2 subgroup. And by CELO's first theorem, we're guaranteed that at least one CELO2 subgroup would exist. And we could do the same thing for 9 or 5. We, you know, any subgroup of order 9 would be called a CELO3 subgroup, and any subgroup of order 5 would be a CELO5 subgroup. Next, we'll prove a couple results about P groups. This first theorem states that if you have a P group, the center of a P group is non-trivial. So if G is a P group, which again just means that the order of G is a power of a prime number P, then G has a non-trivial center. So we can think, think of it as the center of G does not equal the trivial subgroup containing just the identity. So for our proof, we're going to use the class equation. So let's assume that G has order P to the N. So for some prime number p and uh, some integer n greater than or equal to 1, by the class equation, we know that the order of g equals the order of the center of g plus sum it's the sum over all these indices of centralizers, and these, these indices correspond to the conjugacy classes that are not contained in the center. So where the sum runs over representatives, of the distinct non-central conjugacy classes then for each representative of these non-central conjugacy classes for each i, the index of the centralizer of AI 
would equal the order of G divided by the order of the centralizer. And since the order of G is P to the N, and the order of the centralizer is also a power of P, we see that this would equal P to the K for some integer K. And K is going to be greater than or equal to one and less than N. So K has to be greater than or equal to one because the centralizer of AI cannot equal G. And K has to be less than N because the order of the centralizer of AI has to be greater than one. So we see that the index of the centralizer of AI has to equal a, a power of P. And we're going to use this to show that P divides the index of any of the centralizers of the AI. So we can conclude that P divides the index of each one of these elements AI. So we have the class equation. If we just rearrange this class equation, we have the order of G minus the sum of the indices And that will equal the order of the center. But we know that P divides the order of G and P divides the order of each of these indices. And so P will divide the whole left-hand side of this equation. If P divides the left-hand side, then P must divide the right-hand side. And therefore the center is non-trivial. So we have this equation where P divides each term on the left-hand side. Thus P must divide the right-hand side, which is the order of the center of G. And hence the order of the center cannot equal one. And that means that the center is non-trivial. So there we've established that any P group has a non-trivial center. Next we'll prove a lemma that we'll need to prove the next theorem. Let G be a group with center Z of G. Then consider the factor group G over the center of G. So if the factor group G mod the center of G is cyclic, then we'll show that the group G is abelian.
Okay, so let's assume that the factor group is cyclic. So let's let the factor group G mod center of G be the cyclic subgroup generated by the left coset X times the center of G. Where X is just some element of the group G. Now I'm going to take an arbitrary element of the group G, let's call it A. So let A be an arbitrary element of G. And let's look at the left coset A times the center of G. So this coset can be written as an integer power of the generator X times the center of G because the factor group is cyclic. So I can write A times the center of G as a power, say X times the center of G to the power N since this factor group is cyclic, but then the left coset to the power n just equals the left coset of x to the power n times the center of g. And the element a is in the left coset a times the center of G. So since A is an element of the left coset A times the center of G, and we've shown that this equals X to the N times the center of G, we can actually write A as x to the power n times some element z1 of the center. So for some z1 in the center of g. Now, I just took an arbitrary element a of our group g, and I showed that it could be represented as x to some integer times z1 where z1 is in the center. So I'm going to do the same thing for an arbitrary element b of the group g. So similarly, if b is in g, then I can write b as an integer power of x, let's say x to the m, times some z2 in the center. Now we'll show that g is abelian. So I'll take a times b And rewrite these in as x to the n z1 times x to the m z2. Now recall that z1 and z2 are in the center, so I can commute them with any elements in the group. So by the commutativity of z1, I can re rewrite this as x to the n times x to the m z1 z2. And then I can combine x to the m and x to the n as x to the n plus m. And let's commute the z1 and the z2 now. And then I will commute z2 with the element x to the n plus m.
and then I'll break up the x as x to the m times x to the n. And finally, commuting z2 and x to the m gives x to the m z2 times x to the n z1, which is exactly b times a. So I've shown that for arbitrary elements a and b, we have the product ab equals the product ba. Thus, g is abelian. Now our next theorem states that if g has order p squared for some prime p, then g is abelian. Moreover, by the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups, the only abelian groups of order p squared are the cyclic subgroup of order p squared and the group zp cross zp. So the group g is isomorphic to either the cyclic group of order p squared or zp cross zp. Let's begin our proof. So consider the center of the group G. The center is a subgroup of G and so we know by Lagrange's theorem that the order of the center must divide the order of the group, which is p squared. So by Lagrange's theorem, the order of the center of G divides p squared. Well, the only divisors of p squared, the only positive divisors of, of p squared are 1, p, and p squared. But our previous theorem tells us that the order of the center of G cannot be 1. Thus, we know that the order of the center must be equal to p, or p squared. Well, if the order of the center is p squared, then that means that every element of g is in the center of g, and therefore g is abelian. So if the center of g has order p squared, then, then g equals the center of g, and that's the same as saying that g is abelian. So now we need to consider the case when the center has order p. Well, if the center has order p, then look at the factor group, g mod the center of g. Then the order of this factor group would be equal to the order of g 
divided by the order of the center of G. So this would be P squared divided by P, which is P. Then the factor group would have order P. Well, any group uh, with a prime order is cyclic. So therefore, since this factor group has prime order, it is therefore cyclic. And our previous lemma tells us, therefore, that, that G is abelian. So by our previous lemma, G is abelian. So we've just shown that if G has order P squared, then G must be abelian. And then as I claimed earlier, the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups shows us that G has only two possible isomorphism classes. So by the fundamental theorem, finite, Abelian groups, G is isomorphic to the cyclic group of order P squared, or G is isomorphic to the cyclic group of order P cross the cyclic group of order P. Every group whose order is a prime squared is abelian.